I know everybody can hear me through the microphone, but I'm going to try to do something, uh, which means I'm going to move away from the microphone and hope that you can still hear me. If it presents a problem, I will happily return to the microphone. But um, as all of you know, our, our good friend, uh, mentor at bars, uh, seldom uses the microphone. And uh, when you work with the National Park Service, as I have for so long, uh, the microphone sometimes is not intimidating to me, but it is very shackling. It keeps me from going where I want to go. Um, and I usually don't use any notes. I do have some things in here tonight that I may or may not use uh, because I think it, uh, it could help tell the story of September Suspense in some of their own words. But uh, typically I don't use any notes either. So I'm going to move away and see if you can still hear me. And if you can, uh, probably most of the program won't be from behind uh, the lectern here at the microphone. So let's see how this sounds. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Is this working? Yes. yes. This is okay. Everybody good over here? And if I turn this way, can you hear me over there? Yeah. Very good. Okay. Yes, that was the firm one. Very good. All right. All right. Outstanding. Good. Thank you. Uh, it really is great to be back, Bob. Thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, I, I've never been here in June, and I know that June is the time that the transition occurs between one president and the next president. So, uh, as I noted for Brian in his assigned book that he was gracious enough to purchase earlier this evening, uh, inauguration night. Congratulations. Uh, very happy to be part of that, and uh, happy to see an actual transition. So, I also know, knowing many of you over the years uh, who are uh, former presidents of this organization, that you have to work to attain that title. That this is not something that is given to you, but it is something that you earn uh, through a progression of steps that the round table puts you through. Basically, I understand as you go through those steps, if you screw up anywhere, you're out. And you don't become a president, and so it gives them a chance to test you along the way as you elevate up in position. And so to get there is a tribute to you. Obviously, you don't screw up. And uh, again, I think it's a very interesting form of, of succession that you have here with the Chicago Roundtable. Almost no other roundtable in the United States has. There's many roundtables that I speak to where you have a president for life. And the reason the person's a president for life is not because they are a dictator, but because nobody else will take the job. <laughs> and so I think it's really good the, the way that you've set it up here. I remember the first time I came here, was in 1983. January of 1983. Why in the world would I want to come to Chicago in January of 1983? I was young, but I wasn't stupid. And I wondered what I was doing here that night. Uh, but I didn't think I was going to make it. And I must tell you that it was one of the most exciting things for me to be coming to Chicago in 1983. And there's a reason for that. I'd never been here, but that's not the reason I was excited. The reason was that I joined my Civil War Roundtable, my own Civil War Roundtable, in the area where I grew up, when I was pretty young, I want to try something here. I'm just going to ask a question. How young are you now? What you? Ten years old. Stand up, please. Ten years old. All right. I was a member of my Civil War Roundtable in Hagerstown, Maryland, at age eight. <laughs> even had to be a little bit, not much. I was probably about your size. Thank you very much. Be my model for a moment. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I doubt that. I doubt that I know as much as he does. Not even now, probably. He's <laughs> pretty good. The other thing that, that was interesting is that uh, the Hagerstown Civil War Roundtable, which is located in Western Maryland, of course, if you're familiar with this campaign, the Maryland campaign of 1862, Hagerstown plays a very significant role. And so Hagerstown was created in the fashion of the Chicago Roundtable. You were much, much older. Of course, you were created in 1940. Hagerstown comes into existence 16 years later in 1956. But it is still one of the last surviving roundtables of the first couple of decades of organizations that were created in the 1940s and 1950s. And so last night, of course, I had the great privilege of speaking to the Malky Roundtable and Milwaukee was number two, 1947. But everyone in the Civil War Roundtable movement knows this is just a matter of you know it. The very first roundtable is you. And I always had great respect for the fact that you don't refer to yourselves as the Chicago Civil War Roundtable. You refer to yourselves as the Civil War Roundtable. <laughs> 
<laughs> Nobody else can put G A G in front of the four round table and know who you're talking about, but we do. Those of us in the in the organizations do. And so uh, here I am joining a round table when I'm eight years old. The idea being that someday I may actually work for the National Park Service, might become a park ranger, may become a historian, and use that as my career. That was my ambition. Even when I was in the sixth grade, I decided that's what I wanted to do. Because I grew up six miles from Harpers Ferry, six miles from Antietam, and when I would awake in the morning and look out to the east toward the rising sun, I looked right at South Mountain. South Mountain was one mile from my home, and Crampton's Gap was right in front of my home. So I grew up right in the heart of Civil War country, at least that which is associated with aspects of the Maryland campaign in September of 1862. I couldn't help but be surrounded by the American Civil War. And one reason I joined a round table at AJ was because my father, John Fry, the unofficial historian of Washington County, Maryland, where I grew up, where is the host county of Antietam. Uh, my father uh, joined the Hagerstown Roundtable in 1957. Um, and so uh, I was telling Roger last night that um, I did also have the great privilege of being the president of my roundtable in Hagerstown at age 17. <laughs> well, what's the big deal? I've already been the roundtable member for nine years. <laughs> I'm a veteran for heaven's sake. <laughs> At 18, I was reelected, so he must have liked me as president. So I always have a, a great uh, uh, fondness for my own home round table. But probably, and I will, I would say this to any round table anywhere at any time, and I've spoken down to nearly 90 Civil War round tables over the last 35 years. And uh, without doubt, the most memorable moment for me was in January of 1983 when I came to address the Civil War Roundtable, because you see, I thought that addressing the Civil War Roundtable would be the pinnacle of my career. <laughs> I didn't know it would be the start of my career. And um, Merle Sumner and Pat Sumner, which is a name that some of you will remember, some of you might remember the Sumners. Now, Pat Sumner, in fact, was the first woman president of the Civil War Roundtable. Great tribute to Pat. Uh, had been on Bud Robertson's campaigning with Lee seminar in the summer of 2000, summer of 1982. And uh, I was the chief guide. I, Bud had known me since I'd been in e level because I heard Bud speak to the Hagerstown Civil War Roundtable in the 1960s and the 1970s when I was growing up. And so uh, Bud uh, was aware now that I graduated from college and was working for the National Park Service as the staff historian at Harpers Ferry, so he'd asked me to lead the uh, uh, campaigning seminar in 1982, and Burrow and Pat were on that program that week, and uh, they were gracious enough to invite me to speak in January of that uh, 1983. So here I came, and I, I don't know, I, I welcome you to disprove this. I hope that you don't disprove this, but I think Bob and I were speaking earlier this evening. I think I hold the record as the youngest speaker to address the Civil War Roundtable. I was 23 years old when I was your feature speaker in January 19, whatever, 83 or something like that. I was just a little over, almost 24, not quite. And so it's uh, a real privilege to be with you this evening, to be back. I've had the opportunity to be your guide on tours. Uh, and to speak to you several times, but uh, again, to be here this evening for your last meeting of this campaign, it's, it's a great honor. Uh, the other thing that I'm excited about is that, you know, historians uh, have different paths and different interests. Um, and one of the things that some of us do in public history is not only do we have the opportunity to meet wonderful people like you, but uh, people that we sometimes uh, know the name of but we don't expect to meet. And I had that happen to me recently. I, uh, was uh, doing a, I was asked to do a program, this call came out of the blue, uh, in the National Park in Harpers Ferry, uh, from an uh, uh, engineer, um, a uh, aerospace engineer. And he was telling me that he was going to bring a group of aerospace engineers to Harpers Ferry in the vicinity, and he wanted me to give an evening speech uh, to the group. So I listened for a few more details, and I soon discovered that they were coming here to do, they were going to be hunting on a farm, and they were going to be, uh, uh, shooting uh, their weapons at the clay pigeons, etc. So it's going to be an entertaining weekend for them. And basically, he was asking me to show up and be the kickoff entertainment. 
And I, was, I was trying to figure out how guns and hunting and shooting clay pigeons had anything to do with the Civil War and me starting things off. So I said, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, and so uh, I just flat out said I'm not going to do it. So a little time went by, I got another call, this time from the president of the company, and uh, they're elevating up the chart here a bit, and uh, he said, we really would like for you to come and speak to us, and then he started to tempt me with food, lots of good food they were going to have that night. And uh, I still said, no, I'm not interested, um, I really uh, would prefer uh, uh, that you get someone else. Well, ultimately what happens is, uh, they do agree to uh, give a donation to the nonprofit organization that supports my national park, and it was a sizable donation, and that was hard to refuse. Uh, it didn't come to me, but it came to the organization. And so I agreed to go to this uh, gathering of these aerospace engineers. I didn't know any of these people. I wasn't even familiar with most of their company names, but they were there, there were 22 of them with their wives, uh, there to have a good, fun weekend, and they started to take me down the line, introducing me from person to person to person. And I finally came upon a person and I stopped and I looked at the person for a moment and I thought, I recognize you and there's no way I can figure out how I recognize this person. And he stuck out his hand and he said, Neil Armstrong. <laughs> I'm glad I attended that night. <laughs> uh, all of us have had the opportunity over the years to meet people that we consider special, uh, people that we even consider uh, transformative, uh, people that we might even think of as heroes. Uh, well, when I was growing up in the 1960s, there was one or two things I wanted to be. I wanted to want to be a historian or an astronaut. That was life. And that was it. There was no other options. When I discovered that an astronaut needed to know math, that eliminated that option. <laughs> so I had a singular role in life to become a historian. But there was Neil Armstrong standing in front of me with his hand extended, uh, the first person, of course, to set foot upon the moon. And so he was very gracious, very nice. I went on and met other people uh, now thinking, my goodness, what am I going to say in the presence of Neil Armstrong? And uh, when it came time for the program, Neil sat right in front of me, right there, uh, three feet from me. And it was fascinating because he never took his eyes off of me during a, about a 20 minute presentation. And I didn't think I was that important or that fascinating, but whatever I was saying, he thought was very interesting. But I did note at one point that he took his eyes off of me just for a moment and he was kind of looking off in space behind me and what was happening at the time was there were massive thunderstorms all around us the only place that there was light and not lightning was where we were the only place it was not raining was where we were and of course we we're out in the open ground it was fairly safe because we can hear the thunder but the lightning was not too near us but he, he glanced off, and I noticed almost everyone in the audience <coughs> glancing off for a moment. So I slowed, slowed down, stopped, paused, and I noticed eyes starting to come back upon me. Well, when the program was over, Neil came up. He was the first one, came up, shook my hand, thanked me for my presentation, and actually apologized. He said, Dennis, he said, for a moment, you lost my attention. And I said, yes, I noticed that. And he said, no, no, he said, I want to apologize. But something happened while you were speaking and you didn't see it. And then he explained to me, now this is, remember now, the context of this. Here is the first human to set foot on the moon. The context was that in all that stormy weather around me at that moment, and all these dark clouds that were behind me at that moment, suddenly these dark clouds parted, opened, and there was the full moon <laughs> on the night before the full moon was closest to the planet Earth. That massive, massive moon that we all saw about, what, six weeks ago with us. There it was, the pair of these moons. But there it was. And, of course, he looked at that for a moment when the skies opened and there it was. And uh, 
So I'm, I'm privileged to be with you because for you, all of you are, are in many respects um, those who study and share the same passion that I do. But I just want you to know that Neil Armstrong loves American history. And he was the most kind and gentle and unassuming person that any of us would ever hope a hero would be. Um, speaking of heroes, one of my favorites, of course, is uh, one of your favorites, Abraham Lincoln. And I want to ask my own trivia question. Now, which one of you never misses any of the trivia questions? Never misses any trivia questions? Please, get it! Please! All right. This will be remembered. Yes, it will. Remember if you get this right. All right. Here's my trivia question. A little bit of quick paragraph. A little bit of intro. You all know about September the 17th, 1862. The questions that were asked this evening on the quiz dealt with September the 17th, the Battle of Antietam. What I argue in September the Suspense, the book that many of you purchased and I appreciate very much this evening, is that what leads up to September the 17th, 1862, little is known about that. Very little, actually. We know some basics. We've got some principles. We've got some thoughts. But in reality, that period leading up to September the 17th, that two-week period, the 1st of September to the 17th of September has never adequately been examined nor studied. So here is my trivia question. The pressure is on. <laughs> I'm going to choose a date. The date is September the 11th. September the 11th, 1862. Something very significant happens. That involves the President of the United States. It'll be a crucial moment for the President. September 11th, 1862. What do you think it is? He watches the Chicago Cubs game and they lose the kind of <laughs> I'll give you a second try. Okay, this is multiple choice, second time? I'll give you a second try. Just because he's a good sport being up here in front of us. September 11th, Lincoln. Important decision. Emancipation Proclamation decides to go through with it. You're close but not correct. I will say this. On September the 11th, 1862, arriving from Chicago in the nation's capital was a delegation of ecumenical ministers from Chicago who came to meet with the President of the United States to demand that you immediately issue an Emancipation Proclamation. That was September the 11th, 1862. You refused to see them on September the 11th, 1862. You refused. Yes, you're Illinois. They're coming from Illinois. Yes. Chicago, indeed Chicago, connect, but you refused because you had something more important to do on September the 11th, 1862. The ministers will wait and the emancipation demand will wait. Mr. Lincoln, I just elevated you. You're now the president. You have an important decision to make on September the 11th. I'll give you a little more context. On September the 11th, 1862, your enemy, the Confederate Army, is not threatening you and your capital directly. It's even worse. Now you might say, what can be worse than threatening Washington? I'll tell you what's worse. On September the 11th, 1862, Robert E. Lee is located about five miles from the Mason-Dixon line. 
He's not worried about Washington. He's not concerned about Washington. He's not going to Washington. Washington is not material to him. But Pennsylvania is. And in fact, not only is Lee going to Pennsylvania, the entire Confederate Army is going to Pennsylvania. It's not there yet, but it's close. So on September the 11th, 1862, here's the Mason-Dixon line, and Robert E. Lee is that far from it at Hagerstown, waiting to go north, waiting for Stonewall Jackson, who is currently occupied in the vicinity of Harper's Ferry, a little less than 30 miles south of Lee's position. So Mr. President, on September the 11th, 1862, you face a momentous decision in the context of we about to cross not just the Potomac River, but into a state that you depend upon to ensure victory for the North, Pennsylvania. You know what your decision is? Send McClellan after Lee. Well, yes and no. <laughs> because you've given McClellan another assignment. You've given General McClellan actually three assignments. Assignment number one, protect Washington. He has succeeded. You made a decision earlier in September to elevate George McClellan to command of the Army of the Potomac after you put him on the shelf. This is a very difficult thing for you to do. This is called humility. <laughs> <laughs> Humility, and you're in the presence of a humble man. I have a lot to be humble about, though. <laughs> so that, that turned out to be a good decision. McClellan has stopped me. The second thing that you ordered McClellan to do was to protect Baltimore. Baltimore is the key, in many respects, to the campaign in September of 1862. When the Confederate Army goes north across the Potomac River, the most fortified city in the world in September of 1862 is Washington. The most endangered city in the United States in September of 1862 is Baltimore, where there are no fortifications. Now there's some guns there, and there's some federal militia there, and there are a few federal troops there. But consider this, Mr. President, that if Baltimore should fall to the Confederates, you are surrounded by the Confederates. You are cut off by the Confederates, and I don't care how fortified your city is, you've got no food, no supplies, and no troops coming into Washington. So the answer to strangulation of Washington is Baltimore and seizing the ground north of the city by Baltimore. Now, you figured this out without any military training, and so did George McClellan with lots of military training. And you are ecstatic on September the 11th, 1862, because you will receive a message from McClellan that says, I now believe Baltimore is safe. <laughs> while, while current historians, <laughs> more modern historians have been accusing McClellan of the slows, as you like to describe at one point, that McClellan was not moving rapidly after the enemy, with the enemy located in Frederick, Maryland, nearly uh, 50 miles from the capital, what McClellan was doing, he wasn't chasing Lee. He was following the President's instruction. You protect Washington, and you protect Baltimore. So the main thrust of the United States Army during the first and second week of September following the invasion was to protect Baltimore, protect the railroads, and protect the city of Baltimore from the north to ensure the protection of Washington. So McClellan's doing very well, and you're quite pleased. Your cabinet is not pleased with you for making this decision, as you noted in your, in your uh, uh, quiz. But you have made the right choices at this point. So now here we are on September the 11th with good news that Baltimore is protected, but bad news that Washington is, a, is, is watching the Confederate Army lunging now toward Pennsylvania. More bad news will arrive for you when you now learn that the Confederate Army is also moving against Harper's Ferry, that Lee has split his army, and that he himself and Longstreet and Hood are at Hagerstown ready to launch into Pennsylvania, and Jackson is moving against Harpers Ferry, where he intends to destroy Union force there. So you've got a good news day and a bad news day on September the 11th, and then arrives this news. This comes from the governor of Pennsylvania. Now, he's the president. This is the governor of the state 
that is in grave danger, that is fearful of the Confederate Army crossing into Pennsylvania in 1862, not three, 62, the governor will sound a siren. And this is what he's going to write to you on September the 11th. Andrew Curtin, a friend of yours, a Republican, to the President of the United States. And I quote, he's speaking of the Confederates, their destination, Mr. President, is Harrisburg or Philadelphia. Send here not less than 80,000 troops. Now, order from New York and states in the East all available forces at once. Send them here. The time for decided action by the national government has arrived. What may we expect? Bumpkiss. <laughs> nothing. Well, here's, if you still want to give me nothing, I'm going to finish with this, Mr. President. Listen to this. This is the governor of Pennsylvania pleading, begging the President of the United States so, so that you understand just how, how desperate they are at this moment. And I quote, It is our only hope to save the North and crush the rebel army. Do not suppose for one instant that I am unnecessarily alarmed. So, Mr. President, what's your decision? On September the 11th, you've got this urgent message, urgent plea from the governor of Pennsylvania requesting immediate assistance to save his state. What are you going to do? I'm going to say nothing much. That is the correct answer. You may be seeing <laughs> <laughs> On September the 11th, 1862, Abraham Lincoln did indeed face a momentous decision. What is he going to do? The Confederate Army was not just an army that we envision is about to fight about. In September of 1862, Northerners are fearful of the Confederate Army for the following reasons. <clears throat> Two words, John Pope. Since July and August of the same year, Pope has been in Virginia. Pope has been executing the law of the land adopted by the United States Congress in July of 1862, called the Second Confiscation Act. This was not a nice law if you were a Southerner. This did not treat you well if you were a rebel. If you were a Confederate, the Second Confiscation Act was directed at you, personally at you. And what I mean by personal was the Second Confiscation Act does exactly that. The United States government by law, will take your property. And you will get no comp compensation for the confiscation. Now they're going to warn you in July of 1862 that if you are still in rebellion 60 days after this law has been adopted, then we intend to not only confiscate property, meaning homes or crops, but we also, as a government of the United States, intend to confiscate your most valuable property, which are slaves. We're going to give you a 60-day warning to put your arms down and quit this foolishness, end this rebellion, quit your treason, now! And if you don't, we will take your property and we'll make you all poor. Poor, poor people. John Pope began executing the provisions of the Confiscation Act almost immediately, in July and August of 1862. Why did Robert E. Lee label him a miscreant? Why did Robert E. Lee say that Pope needed to be suppressed? The answer is that in Northern Virginia, in the summer of 1862, Pope and his men were burning farm fields, destroying farms, 
removing people from their homes and sending them out of the lines, not allowing any communication back to their homes, creating refugees. And the North and Pennsylvania knew about it. Massachusetts knew what was happening. New York knew what was happening. And they condoned it. Their men were executing these particular aspects of a new war, a war on the civilians of the South. The first time that the war is being conducted on the civilians of the South. This is long before Sherman, my friends. This is long before Sheridan. This is long before Grant was <coughs> command. In the summer of 1862, the, the northern war effort is now being directed against Confederate civilians in an experiment in Northern Virginia that is certain to spread. And John Pope is the laboratory master who's conducting the experiment. So on September the 11th, 1862, as Robert E. Lee is crouched to leap into Pennsylvania, Pennsylvanians are convinced that when the Army of Northern Virginia crosses that line, they will become the John Popes of the South. That Lee's army will seek vengeance. That Lee's army will burn and destroy and create the new refugees. These people are terrified because they know that's the brand of warfare they themselves have been executing against their former brothers and sisters. The Civil War has truly become uncivil in the summer of 1862. And they had every reason to believe that uncivil war would go north of the border. In fact, the Confederate Congress will announce on September the 11th, 1862, after four days of debate, that a new war policy has been adopted. And part of that policy involves offensive operations against the North in association with acts of vengeance. This is now officially adopted by the Confederate government. So if you live in Pennsylvania in September of 1862, and the Confederate Army has just been sanctioned as an offensive weapon with authority to, to conduct vengeful acts against you in retaliation for the acts that you have performed in Northern Virginia, how do you feel on September the 11th, 1862, when Governor Curtin asked for the help of the United States government and the President of the United States rejects the plea? Well, just how bad was it in Pennsylvania? The governor, sensing that he was not going to get help from the government of the United States, sends this plea to his own citizens. Listen to this. Citizens of Pennsylvania, your services are demanded for the defense of your state. The enemy soon will cross your boundary line, and buoyant of plunder and rapine is marching towards our capital. The present and future prosperity of our state, the welfare of our cities, the safety of our homes and families depend upon an instant and unanimous response. Before another morn dawns, every military organization in this commonwealth should gather and be prepared to march against the enemy. And finally, I just want to, so if you don't get it, these are the words of the governor to his own people. He would say, we begin now to realize that our own valleys, our own riversides, may be made the scene of this conflict. That instead of invaders, we are about to become the invaded. That flame and pillage and slaughter, which has wasted distant regions, may now hold carnival upon our peaceful fields and around our quiet homes of our own state. We now are called upon to stand in literal defense of our firesides, granaries, warehouses. This may be our final ordeal. Now I say all this because you know none of that happened. You know that ultimately the Army of Northern Virginia didn't cross the line and go into Pennsylvania in September of 1862. You know that all this fear, all this trembling you just heard in those words, all that feeling of panic doesn't 
happen ultimately because Lee's army on September the 17th, 1862, will be stopped. That the invasion will terminate. That it will end. And McClellan has accomplished your third mission, which is to remove the enemy from Northern Territory. Mission accomplished. The reason I wanted to emphasize September the 11th, 1862 for you is this. We as historians, and all of us collectively as study, studiers of history, have this tendency to take some moment in time and freeze it. Uh, think of it as only this, it, it just drops out of the sky, September the 17th. There it is. This is what happened. And here are the consequences that result. But that's really very unfair to history because September the 17th is only a collective of what's happening preceding it. And what I tried to do in September suspense was look at what was preceding September the 17th what was happening in the United States prior to September the 17th. You know what happened on the 17th. But do you realize prior to the 17th that not only was Robert E. Lee invading the North, but what about Braxton Bragg? Kentucky has been invaded. Louisville is in danger. What about Kirby Smith? Kirby Smith is five miles from Cincinnati on September the 11th. 1862. Five miles where there are no defenses. There's no army. And there's Lou Wallace who shows up. He hasn't written Ben Hur yet. He's probably praying as if he has been Hur at that moment. Doesn't look good for Cincinnati. In western Virginia, Charleston. In the salt regions of Western Virginia, along the Canal River, a Union army has been expelled from Western Virginia, and another route of invasion has opened for a Confederate army operating in southwestern Virginia into now threatened and panicked Ohio. The three greatest contributors of, of uh, men to the Northern War effort by the uh, summer of 1862 are New York State, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. And two of those three states are about to face invasion of the Confederate Army. And where are the men who are there to defend those states? They're not there. They're in the Army. And they're not in Ohio, and they're not in Pennsylvania. And the President of the United States says, I'm not sending that Army into Pennsylvania. Not yet, anyway. So a desperate moment for the North. I would argue that prior to September the 17th, 1862, that at no other time during the war, was the Confederacy so close to success? Was the Confederacy so near actual independence? How close was the Confederacy to independence? Well, I'll leave you with this. On September the 11th, 1862, appeared in newspapers across the North, headlines. And this is what the headlines said, and I quote, The Terms of Peace. Now whose peace terms are these on September the 11th, 1862? They're not Abraham Lincoln's. Lincoln is in no position to be offering peace to anyone on September the 11th, 1862. These are Confederate peace terms. Confederate peace terms that are circulated in newspapers throughout the North in New York, in Chicago, in Boston, in Philadelphia. And this is how they began. These are Confederate peace terms. And I quote, It seems that the recent victories of the Confederate Army have aroused a feeling for peace, which is beginning to find public expression in northern cities. We have no doubt that thousands in the North who heretofore silently submitted to the popular cry will now speak out and demand peace since all their armies have been defeated and no force intervenes between our victorious armies and the northern cities. General Lee, it went on, understands the northern character. Well enough to understand the surest guarantee of a peace 
is the vigorous prosecution of his present successes. Nothing but a speedy peace, terms of speedy terms of peace will prevent invasion of northern territory and the protection of the enemy's home from the same kind of warfare that has been practiced upon our homes in the south. When the fact of this invasion is forcibly presented to the northern mind, our terms of peace will be accepted. Now that, my friends, is not arrogance. That is confidence. Confidence. The South is convinced it's going to win. Oh yes. Are the odds against it? Absolutely. Does it have any business thinking of itself as a victor? Of course not. But in September of 1862, it does feel bold, emboldened, and so confident of success that the Southern Army is predicted that the terms of peace will be negotiated, and in fact they will be negotiated in a hallowed place, Independence Square in Philadelphia. The Confederate Army is coming to Philadelphia, and the Union Army will not be able to stop it. Now, is this designed to be great theater? No. But it was for them. You see, we know too much. We know this didn't happen. It's like a football game. You're a big sports city. Or a basketball game. Or a baseball game. You can hope that the Chicago White Sox are going to win that ball game, but you don't know when the first pitch is thrown. You can hope the Cubs are going to win the ball game. A lot of hope required right now for the Cubs. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't know what the result's going to be. That's the suspense of the game. We don't know the outcome. But the next morning, we can either watch the replays of the home runs or the great pitches or the errors. We can read the box scores. But you see, that's replay. It's already happened. So we know the outcome by then. But my point is that on September the 11th, 1862, no one, my friends in the North, knew the outcome. They didn't know about September the 17th. They didn't know there would be a fight at Sharpsburg. They didn't know that a cornfield owned by a dunker, a pacifist, soon would become the place of the bloodiest soil in American history. They didn't know about the Dunker Church and the Westwoods around it where 2,200 Federals would be slaughtered in 20 minutes. They didn't know about the Sunken Road, which would soon become the Bloody Lane. They don't know about the Roarback Bridge that soon will become renamed after General Burnside. They don't know that. All they know on September the 11th, 1862 is the same thing you know before the first pitch is thrown. You don't know. You don't know the outcome. And I would like to challenge you tonight to this. As you read history, don't just focus upon the event that we call historic. And don't just analyze through replay over and again that moment frozen in time. But instead consider what leads to that moment. What brought us to that point. And what were the people feeling? History should be feeling, not just an intellectual exercise, but what are people feeling? And I tell you, in September of 1862, on September the 11th, people were feeling this. That's a perfect way to conclude. You can say, I cannot possibly appreciate or understand what they were feeling on September the 11th, 1862. I wasn't there. I'm not a Pennsylvanian. I really don't care. Well, you can share their moment, because we all have a shared moment. September the 11th, 2001. Just stop for a moment. Just stop for a moment, take that breath, and remember where you are on September the 11th. At the moment, 
that is frozen in your mind by 9.02 a.m. that morning. Regardless of our backgrounds, regardless of where we grew up, regardless of our education, regardless of our genetics and our cultures, all of us shared that moment in this room. Most of us, a 10-year-old didn't, but most of us did. And all of us feel that moment. And I want you to ask yourself silently how you felt at that moment. Be honest with yourself as you take yourself back to that point. This isn't an intellectual exercise for us. September 11, 2001 is important to our country because it does transform us. It does change us. But it made us all feel a lot at that moment. And that's the connection that you have with the people of Pennsylvania and the people of Ohio on September 11, 1862. Did you feel fear? I did. Did you feel uncertainty? I certainly did. Did you feel terror? I did. So did our friends in Pennsylvania and Ohio on September the 11th, 1862. This time, the terror was not coming from outside of America, but from other Americans and the Confederate States of America soon to become, perhaps, a permanent nation of its own in September of 1862. Let me tell you, the suspense was intense. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. stimulating uh, talk and, and, and certainly a different way of looking at history. I'm sure everybody's reflecting on that at this moment. Uh, in honor of your talk, we want to present to you a check. Uh, we make a, a donation on behalf of uh, your speech here tonight to uh, the Harper's Ferry Historical Association. And thank you again. Okay, Bob. Well, pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, we have time for a few questions. If anybody has a question for me, we'd be honored to try to answer it for you. Now, don't be, now, Milwaukee asked a lot of questions last night. I understand there's a competition between Milwaukee and Chicago on who asked a number of questions. Milwaukee asked more than three questions last night. We actually cut off the discussion period, didn't we, Roger? We cut it off. They asked a lot of questions last night. How many were informed questions? Who's the I guess there uh, Dennis, you put out very well, of course, out of politicians. In Pennsylvania and elsewhere panicked in September of 1862, and that's certainly correct. Uh, what evidence is there that the people, not the, just the politicians, we know politicians posture, we know that Abraham Lincoln got telegrams every month from panicky politicians saying, send troops here, send troops there, as did President Davis. What evidence is it that the people of the North were panicked. The evidence is this. Governor Curtin puts out a call for militia. Those that are not men in the service, but new recruits. The traditional militia. The idea that we call up our forces. This is the whole idea of some respect behind the Second Amendment. You got that gun there if you need it. And if you're called into action as a militiaman, we need you now between 18 and 35. In five days, 75,000 Pennsylvania militiamen gathered in Harrisburg. That is panic. That's, I'm going to defend my home from these enemy invaders. That is fear. It wasn't, it wasn't nationalism that brought them. It wasn't Lincoln that brought them. It might not have even been the governor's call. It was a plea to defend your fireside, your granaries, your warehouses, your rivers, your farms your families, and they showed up 75,000 in less than five days. The same thing happened in Ohio. David Todd, the governor of Ohio, put out his own proclamation, and Lou Wallace, who had no army, had a massive army in three days. Almost 50,000 Ohioans in three days, focused, concentrated in Cincinnati. 
And so think about that. In, in five days, Ohio and Pennsylvania produces 125,000 men armed to counter the invaders. And they're motivated by fear and panic to protect their home sides. Yes, sir. Is there, how does the, the aspect of the fact that you have a lot of like <coughs> troops in hand, English in that area right there, which passes? Well, you have, you have Quakers and Amish and Dunkers, uh, both in Ohio and Pennsylvania. But they're, they're always a minority. They are always a minority. Um, they're concentrated in certain pockets of Pennsylvania, but that they're almost inconsequential with respect to the call. Uh, they, don't, they, of course, do not call. They do not answer the call because of their pacifism. But they're not needed, frankly. They're just not needed. And so, um, um, really immaterial. Yes, sir? What kind of weaponry would the militia have? Whatever they had at home. Whatever they had. Guns. They had flintlocks. They had smooth boards. They had shotguns. They had pistols. They all showed up with whatever they had at their home. So it's hard to call the militia an army. But the fact is that most of them could shoot their weapons. And even if you're Robert E. Lee, if you've got militiamen that potentially are behind a fortified defensive position, and they are fortifying in Philadelphia, my friends, on September the 11th, they are building fortifications. They are fortifying in Harrisburg along the Susquehanna River on September the 11th. They know the rebels are coming. And so they believe that at least they can put them. And Cincinnati, Lou Wallace did the same thing. Lou Wallace goes across the river uh, to Covington and builds massive fortifications uh, to protect Cincinnati from Kirby Smith and possibly Braxton Bragg. So the generals believe that if you can put militia behind an earthwork, they stand a chance because at least they can stand up and shoot at the enemy who is not going to have the advantage of those earthworks. Guns galore of all sorts. They even were bringing powder horns and their own bullets with them. Yes, sir? Why didn't he send troops into Ohio? Good question. He doesn't have them, frankly. We might think of the Union Army being massive, large, and it was in comparison to the Confederate Army. But... McClellan was beginning to parallel General Lee going north into Pennsylvania. So some action was going to occur somewhere. And Lincoln's theory all along was, do not divide the army, but concentrate it. Bring it together. This is what he wanted to do, what Stanton wanted to do. This is really Halleck's brainstorm as uh, the commander, uh, the army chief in charge, general in chief. Bring the army together. Don't respond to these politicians. Don't divide because they will conquer. So concentrate force, then follow the enemy to the death, if possible. Same thing was happening in Ohio. They were trying to take the armies, the Western armies out there that eventually would get to Louisville and then eventually get to Cincinnati. Uh, but it would take a while. They were using the rivers, but they were trying to concentrate their forces. And so Lincoln was responding, but he was not going to go on some wild chase. He was going to try to be very methodical, uh, very organized, and very deliberate in bringing the armies that he has in concentrated mass against the enemies. And if that meant that Harrisburg, Harrisburg fell, so be it. He eventually would get the rebel army. Now, Philadelphia fell, so be it. He eventually would get the rebel army. So the, so the real focus in 1862, again, not 1864, the real focus of the administration in 1862 is the enemy <coughs> army. Yes, sir. <coughs> That's exactly right. It is dizzying, and the odds of that happening were not in favor of the North in September of 1862. The first week of September, Lincoln would be the first to tell you that this is not going to happen. September 22nd, which is my 60-day deadline from when we announce the Confiscation Act, and I'm giving you this warning 60 days forward that you better stop this rebellion or I'm going to slap you and take your property. That would have been ridiculous to do in September of 1862 with the rebel army on the Pennsylvania line and the Confederate army on the Ohio River about to cross into Ohio. 
It would have been ridiculous. And that's exactly why the president on September 11th said to the delegation of Chicago ministers, I don't have time to meet with you right now. And besides, you're asking me to do something ridiculous. Issue a proclamation of emancipation when we can't even control our own territory? He did eventually meet with them on September the 13th. And that's exactly what he told them. You're crazy. Look at the situation, people. Open your eyes. This is not the time of strength for us. This is a moment of great weakness. We might not win this thing. And so uh, it is dizzy that it flipped that quickly as a result of September the 17th. And Lincoln and the Republicans wasted no time to claim victory from what appeared to be absolute potential disaster. And then he, so he took advantage of the moment. Victor, the Sumner, that's on sewer device, delay, delay, maybe we'll get a victory. I feel this, that that great story of Lincoln writing it out in July of 1862, which he did, and the cabinet coming together and talking about this may not be time issue, that all deals with the Confiscation Act. What Lincoln was trying to decide in July of 62 is do we issue it now and just get it over with? The Congress has passed the law that says right now we can do confiscation right now. And they didn't do that because of the military situation in July of 62, and they were facing a worse situation in September of 62. But Lincoln intended to issue the thing if he had any kind of military power to back it up, and that came with AT. Mark? Uh, since the campaign the North it seemed to end quite abruptly. It did end abruptly, we, yes. We don't More abrupt, you know who it ended abruptly for? Robert E. Lee. Yes. But, but what, what the evidence do we have, or what do we know about what were the intentions of the it, it, it's, it's not hidden. What, 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 the question is, what were the intentions of Lee? It's not, it's not hidden at all. September the 4th, September the 4th, as Confederates were already crossing the Potomac River as an invading army, Lee will send a note to the President of the Confederacy and he will say, Mr. President, unless you object, this army is going to Pennsylvania. But Lee knew exactly where he was going. Well, what, what were their intentions when they had, do, do, we, do we have evidence of an intent to... Yes, uh, Lee tells us that also. Lee believes that he can sway the politics of the war dramatically in 1862. Remember, 1862 is an election year, a big one. It's not a presidential year, but every member of the United States House of Representatives is up for re-election. The Republican hold in the House is about that narrow. It's very thin. And so if the Democrats, even the war Democrats, can take the majority in the House, the Confederacy believes that potentially the war can end politically because the House would permit potential negotiation, discussion, mediation of the war that the Democrats are in charge in the House. So that's point one. Point two, Lee was very aware of the diplomatic situation. In July and August of 1862, the House of Commons and the House of Lords debate mediation and intervention in the war. Now, it's not military intervention. They're not going to send the British Navy over here like the French did during the Revolutionary War. They're not going to send British soldiers over here to fight with the Confederates. That's not what they intend to do. The debate is all about, do we intervene and mediate peace between North and South? They decide against it at that moment because they are just now receiving word of Lee's victories around Richmond. Remember, there's no telegraph across the ocean, no transatlantic telegraph. So it takes 10 to 12 days one way for news to go from America to Britain. So by the time the British learn about these great victories around Richmond, there's more momentum. And they learn about the great victory at Second Manassas. There's more momentum. And they learn about the Confederate Army launching into Maryland. There's more momentum. All this is going across the seas. And they are about to go back to the House of Commons and House of the Lords the first week of October of 1862, when word arrives that the invasion has failed and that Lee did not succeed. So there's great evidence that Lee was very conscious of the situation, Davis knew the situation. 
Confederate politicians in Richmond knew the situation. They all were aware that this is our chance. This is our great opportunity. This is the moment we must succeed. So it was for grander strategic purposes, not for retribution. No, nope. nope, not at all. It was, we're going to achieve independence. Yes, sir. Yeah, how do you feel that fits in with these decisions to stand and fight at Antietam rather than get out with his victory at Harper's Ferry and take something, <coughs> something rather than the good person? Well, first of all, Harper's Ferry was never a goal of a campaign. So, uh, so yes, he achieves a mission that was a became a requirement of the campaign. Never really was a goal. <laughs> but why does he stand at Sharpsburg? Well, you're Robert E. Lee. You've had victory after victory after victory. The momentum is on your side. Why go home? Because if you do go home, how will that be perceived? It's all perception. You may save your army. You may rescue your army. You may claim Harper's Ferry as a great victory. But strategically, the grand strategy, you've accomplished nothing. You didn't sway the politics. McClellan can claim victory. The Lincoln administration can claim victory. The North is safe. Washington is safe. Baltimore is safe. Pennsylvania is safe. Ohio potentially is safe if you come back across that river. And so the grand strategy by Lee, not a single objective has been accomplished on September the 17th, not a one. And so Lee decides, you know, I'm gonna to have to fight these people somewhere. I thought it would be elsewhere, but since I'm here, this is where we'll do it. Lee really believed that he could, like he should believe, he'd beaten McClellan time and again, Lee believed he could do it once more. I guess that's, you kind of may have already answered this. Before and after Antietam, what was Lee's opinion on public consolidation? Well, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, debate among Civil War historians and among yourselves about uh, what was Lee's opinion of George McClellan. Now, some will maintain that Lee himself would say that the greatest Union general he ever faced was George McClellan. And that usually brings a great deal of hy hysterical laughter in the room. Um, but, um, if you put it into the context of Lee's best opportunity of the American Civil War, and it's now, it never comes again. Gettysburg, I'm sorry, my friends, but Gettysburg does not match up to this campaign. It's not close. And so Lee loses. He knows he loses. All the momentum that was with the Confederacy is lost. And who stopped him? George B. McClellan. How do you rate George McClellan given the Fargo War, given that he was facing the radical Republicans, given the fact that he's a Democratic general? How do you rate him as a general at, 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 at the Antietam campaign? Uh, many of you have been with me on tours and programs in the past. You've heard me say this, and I'll say it again. I cannot stand George McClellan. <laughs> <laughs> I think that he is insubordinate, he's irreverent to the President of the United States, he's disrespectful, he is arrogant, he's all these things I can't stand about a person. He's the kind of person I would hate to work for. And I couldn't work for because I wouldn't believe him. George McClellan is all about himself. His ego is bigger than Chicago or the traffic jam in Chicago. <laughs> I could go on about why I don't like McClellan. But something happened to me recently. I turned age 50. And when you turn age 50, you get wise. <laughs> and with wisdom comes perspective. And so I started to look at George McClellan as a wise man, me as a wise man, looking at George McClellan with new perspective. And it dawned on me that you know, what I think of McClellan is really immaterial. It's irrelevant. I don't care how I feel about him. What I should look at is what did he achieve? And in this particular campaign, he told you that he saved the Union. Usually brings great laughter. 
<laughs> Brady did. He did save the Union. And I'll tell you exactly when he did it. September the 17th. September the 16th, even. The day before the Battle of Antietam. And I'll talk about this next year when you're with us with Ed Neal on the tour. There's a road that runs by the Dunker Church. You've all seen it. Probably not thought much about it. It's just part of the battlefield. It's called the Hagerstown Sharpsburg Turnpike. That road goes this way from Sharpsburg, and that way, my friends, is north. As long as Robert E. Lee holds that road, the Hagerstown Sharpsburg Turnpike, as long as that road is in his possession, that invasion is a go. Because that road goes due north to Hagerstown, and five miles more, you're across the Mason-Dixon line. One day's march from Sharpsburg, and you are in Pennsylvania. So as long as Lee holds that road, his invasion is alive. Despite Special Orders 191, despite the fact that Jackson's late, despite the fact that McClellan goes after him, despite the Battle of South Mountain, doesn't make any difference. Lee holds the direct avenue north into Pennsylvania on September the 16th. And while <coughs> others complain that McClellan was twiddling his thumbs all day on September the 16th, that is the day that George McClellan changed history because on September the 16th at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Joseph Hooker in the First Corps seized the Hagerstown Turnpike and the invasion is over. Yes, sir. Could you comment on, uh, you just mentioned General or Special Order 191. The conventional wisdom is that McClellan did not act upon it in a, in a decisive or uh, sufficiently quick fashion. Yes, once again, with wisdom, I don't believe it. Not at all. Do you realize that the Union Army on the night of September the 13th was conducting night marches? Burnside with the 9th Corps, Booker with the 1st Corps, were moving towards South Mountain on the night of the 13th. Most historians focus on one order that was transmitted to William Franklin of the Union 6th Corps, and that order was to move in the morning. But you have to understand that Franklin's mission was not Burnside's mission. Franklin's mission was to move toward Harper's Ferry and relieve the siege. Burnside's mission was to cross the mountain and cut off Lee's retreat from Hagerstown or Boonesboro, wherever he was. So they didn't waste any time. That order was probably communicated verbally since Burnside was with McClellan side by side in Frederick and Burnside was moving on the night on September 13, 14. That's the reason that the 1st Division, Cox's Division, was at the base of South Mountain shortly after dawn on the morning of September 14. Is there any evidence that Lee knew that order had been lost? Yes, he absolutely knew. Uh, Lee, I don't believe, I don't, I don't agree with people that say he knew that McClellan had his orders, that the spy in Frederick delivered a message to Stewart, and Stewart delivered a message to Lee, and Lee found out, oh my God, George McClellan has my orders, what am I going to do? That's not what happened. <laughs> what happened was, the Union Army was coming at Robert E. Lee. Confederate Cavalry reported, General Lee, they're coming. I don't understand this. Not only are they coming, they're coming in tens of thousands. They're not stopping. And Lee responded to the fact the rebels, that the Yankees weren't stopping. He had to. He had no choice. He had no choice. The only thing he could do was either pull everybody back from South Mountain and get Jackson out of Harper's Ferry quickly or send his army away from Hagerstown on the Mason-Dixon line and go toward South Mountain and try to give Jackson more time. And that's exactly what he decides to do. Lee, for the moment, turns his head away from Pennsylvania, says, I need to protect my army. I don't understand what McClellan's doing other than here he comes. He's way too fast, way too aggressive. We've got to stop him. What Lee knew about 191 is irrelevant in some respects. And Lee himself will say, shortly after the war, that he did not know McClellan had Special Order 191. That the only time, the first time he discovered it was when McClellan's official reports were issued in the Northern newspapers in August of 1863. Yes? The admirers of Lee have often described him as one of the greatest commanders of all time. How does that claim mesh with the fact that on September the 17th he was defeated by George B. McClellan, a man whom no one other than McClellan ever described as one of the great commanders of all time. Well, Robert E. Lee is, is, uh, is the great commander. He is the greatest commander of the American Civil War, other than one other, the victory. 
U.S. Grant. So I'll put Lee as the second greatest commander of the American Civil War. Um, but the fact is McClellan beat him on September the 17th. And uh, the fact is that the invasion ended on September the 17th. Um, and the fact is that uh, the Army of Northern Virginia does retreat, but it does not retreat until the evening of the 18th, the day after the bloody, bloody carnage of Sharpsburg. So once again, Lee is often censured by historians for not leaving on the 17th when he could get away. And for standing there with a weakened army with small numbers on the 18th when McClellan absolutely could have destroyed him at McClellan F. McClellan and Boo. Well, here's the point. When you come with me next year, for those of you that are with me and Ed on the tour, I'm going to show you something. It's called terrain. And on September the 18th, Robert E. Lee was in a stronger position at Sharpsburg on stronger terrain than he was at any point anywhere on September the 17th. I'll show you exactly where he was on the day after the battle. And if George McClellan had attempted to attack him on the 18th, it would have been a picket pettigrew charge and a disaster for the North. I also will say this, and this is noted in September, in September suspense, I learned a whole lot of things about this period I didn't know, and I've been studying it for close to 40 years as I was working on September suspense. And the principal reason I learned a lot is because I wasn't reading the official records exclusively. I wasn't reading diaries and journals exclusively. All that stuff we normally take a look at as historians. I went to another source. And September suspense is primarily written from this source. Newspapers. The newspapers of the time tell us a whole lot that nobody else does. And I discovered in reading southern newspapers that on September the 4th, the very day of the invasion, the very day the Confederate Army crosses the Potomac River, on September the 4th in Richmond, the President, Davis, issues to all the people of the Confederacy a proclamation of his own. And it was a proclamation of Thanksgiving. And he declared Confederate Thanksgiving Day would be September the 18th, 1862. Robert E. Lee is not going to retreat on Thanksgiving. And he doesn't. Final question, right here. Yes, sir. You mentioned, Dennis, the congressional elections. Did the panic and the fear that people in Pennsylvania and Ohio felt, do you feel that that contributed to some of the outcomes of the congressional elections in early November? Absolutely. I think that the question is, how does, uh, uh, how, how does this affect the overall congressional elections? Now, when you study the 1862 elections, you will discover something that's a bit troubling if you're a Republican. And what you're troubled about in the 1862 elections is you lose seats. The Republicans lost seats. The Republicans lost governorship. The Republicans lost the legislatures. It was a bad year for the Republicans in 1862, but it wasn't bad enough. It wasn't bad enough. You lost seats, but you still held majorities almost everywhere. <coughs> Very narrow, but you still held on. And so there's no question that it was a buoyant success for the Republicans. And I'll say this, all of you know the politics of the war, that McClellan's a Democrat. Lincoln, of course, is not. All of you know that during the war, generals, especially in the United States Army, wore their politics on their sleeve, on their hand, on their chest, and from their mouth. They, everybody knew what political party you supported. Not like today. Today we don't know where, where, what Petraeus is a Democrat or Republican. We don't know that. That'll probably be announced at some point. I didn't know whether Colin Powell was a Democrat or Republican. I had no idea. So he leaves the Army. That's today's Army. In the Army of 1862, we know who the leading Republicans are in the Army. And we know who the leading Democrats are in the Army. And so there's no question in my mind that McClellan, the victor of Antietam, and I, he is the victor, he wins, presents at that moment the greatest threat to the Republican Party. George McClellan does, immediately after that battle. Because George McClellan at that point is the leading Democrat in the United States 
and obviously the greatest threat to the Lincoln re-election campaign in 1864. So they don't have to wait to 1864, ladies and gentlemen. In 1862, the Republican Party immediately, politically, begins a vicious denunciation of George McClellan. And how do they do that? You let him get away. <laughs> you let him escape. George McClellan was blamed for not destroying the Army of Northern Virginia. I'll only leave you with this. Name one Union Army that Robert E. Lee destroyed. Thank you all very much.